Rudyard Kipling was a great British poet whose writings have blessed many of us. Some of us remember the Jungle Book, famous poems Gunga Den, poem If, Recessional, which is heard every year just a week or so ago at Veterans Day. He's the one that wrote Lest We Forget. So he was a very famous poet. And before he died, he made a great amount of money. The story goes, a newspaper reporter came to him once and said, Mr. Kipling, I just read somewhere that somebody calculated that the money you make from your writings amount to over $100 a word. I'd like that job, wouldn't you? Mr. Kipling raised his eyebrows and said, really? I certainly wasn't aware of that. So the reporter cynically reached into his pocket, pulled out a $100 bill, gave it to Mr. Kipling and said, here's a $100 bill, Mr. Kipling. Now, you give me one of your $100 words. Kipling looked at the $100 bill, took it and folded it up, put it in his pocket and said, thanks. <laughs> well, the word thanks is certainly a hundred dollar word, if not a million dollar word. We don't hear it enough. Amen? Amen? One word, too seldom heard, too seldom spoken, too often forgotten. If any person ought to be thankful, or any nation ought to be thankful for its goodness, as Susan spoke, it should be us living in America. If any people in America ought to be grateful, it should be Christians. If any group of Christians ought to be thankful, it should be us here at Hillside. We ought to have, as the sermon title this morning says, an attitude of gratitude. And of course we know Thursday is Thanksgiving. It seems to be it's getting uh, pushed out more and more every year by Christmas, doesn't it? Um, I really like the display this morning on our altar to remind us. I'm mindful this morning as I sat and was listening to Susan of a child. They still teach Thanksgiving in school, don't they? And I can remember as a child, I don't know when, but we were show that all of us have a turkey with us. Now, some of us have been called turkeys. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we're always carrying our turkey with us because turkey has become somewhat a symbol of Thanksgiving. And how many of you know that Benjamin Franklin wanted turkey as the national bird? That was, that'd be interesting conversation today, wouldn't it? If turkey was the American symbol instead of the eagle. But anyway, we were taught that we all carry our turkey with us. It's our hand. How many of you know that? Remember that at school? You put your hand down on a piece of paper and you take a pencil and, or a crayon, you go around your finger, and then when you're done, you do a little bit of decoration, and what do you have? A turkey. And so turkey, of course, we think of that not only as gratitude, thanksgiving, but it also blends into the pilgrims. How do you remember the pilgrims? Nobody remembers the pilgrims. How many of you are having turkey for Thursday? Well, we don't know whether or not uh, turkey was the main dish or anything like that at Thanksgiving, but here's what we do know. We do know that in the early days, the very short story, just to remind you, in 1620, that was a long time ago, 102 pilgrims. There were more but on another ship, but it didn't get going. But anyway, it came later. 102 pilgrims left. England to come to America where they could be free to worship God. Land was sighted on November 9, 1620. The passengers had endured miserable conditions for 65 days. William Brewster led them in Psalm 100 as a prayer of thanksgiving. And I remembered in the other day that this was perhaps my first scripture that I memorized as a child. I remember doing this in a Christmas uh, show in the church that I attended years ago. But I think it's a very uh, good psalm for us to think about 
on Thanksgiving. It's Psalm 100, a psalm of praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his holy name. For the Lord God is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Now I think that's a very appropriate Thanksgiving psalm, don't you? That we truly, as Susan went her top ten list, we surely are thankful. The weather in New England, as you remember, was very harsh that winter, going on about the story of the pilgrims. The winter of 1620 to 21 was harsh. Many pilgrims became sick. By the end of February 1621, 31 of them had died of starvation and sickness, disease, cold weather. During the worst of the sickness, only six or seven of the, of the entire bunch were healthy enough to take care of everybody else. By the end of the winter, only 47 pilgrims had survived. And many of the crew that um, brought the Mayflower had died as well. So now, as Paul Harvey would say, how many remember Paul Harvey? The rest of the story is that come sometime during that Thanksgiving season of 1621, 46 pilgrims and 91 Indians sat down and gave thanks for a beautiful harvest and the preservation of their lives. They had a lot to be thankful for, don't you think? 46 out of 102 was all that was left to give that first thanksgiving. So as the sermon title suggests, attitude is everything. The scripture reading begins with the man who invited Jesus for supper. We've heard this story many times. It's always worth bringing out a few little nuggets of truth that are, that are sprinkled throughout the scripture. And this story is one of those. That we find that as Jesus was eating in the house and and they didn't eat like we do they they actually ate reclined and oftentimes depending on the um, the house and the arrangements their feet they actually their feet was behind them so to speak they almost uh, ate reclining in a kneeling position if you can think of that so because we don't have the exact picture it is it is very plausible that when this woman came in she came in behind him, and his feet were back here. Uh, they could have been out this way as well, but uh, I think the way the story plays out, he was more reclining with his feet bent uh, toward the rear. But regardless of his posture, we read the story, and the woman came in with this box of ointment, and she began to cry. She began to weep. She began to anoint his feet with oil. Not his head, his feet. And as we read the story this morning and as we contemplate what all this meant, another question comes up that cannot be answered. Where did this woman first encounter Jesus? We don't know. We don't know where she encountered him. We don't know how she encountered him. We don't even know why she encountered him. We don't know anything about her other than the fact she showed up. And she showed up and she began to cry, she began to weep, she began to wipe his feet with her hair. I don't know about you, but my wife is finicky about her hair. Ladies, are you finicky about your hair? Can you imagine this story? Can you imagine the dusty, smelly streets of the city and so on and so on because they wore uh, what we might call sandals and that. But it all meant something because as we read the story, Simon, who invited Jesus to his house, was a Pharisee. We might consider him an ultra-religious person, a person who wore his religion somewhat out. He would let everybody know how pious he was. So 
We don't even know why he invited Jesus. Maybe he wanted to be seen and heard. Maybe he wanted him to perform a miracle. We, we really don't know. But we do know one thing. We do know his attitude. And as we read the story and we contemplate inviting someone to your house, what would you do if you invited someone to your house? How many of you haven't anybody over on Thursday? How many of you wish they weren't coming over on Thursday? <laughs> Got you on that one, didn't I? And so you invite somebody over, and maybe with the exception of Thanksgiving, because you're inviting your family and friends, and they know how you are anyway. So there's no sense putting up a pretense. Amen? Just make sure there's a couch and a bed for them to fall over or fall into after they eat that wonderful meal we're about to have. All right? But if you invite someone to your home, there is some type of of hospitality extended, isn't there? Jim, are you going to invite me to your house? <laughs> At least he's honest. And there's a certain amount of hospitality that we all go through regardless if somebody comes into your home. Oftentimes, other than just coming in for a moment and leaving, if they come in, what's one of the first things you ask somebody? Man. Would you like something to drink, or if it was about dinner time, would you like to stay for dinner? Well, not all of you would let somebody stay for dinner, right? Wow. This is a tough crowd today. I'll tell you what. But anyway, we show hospitality. So Simon invited Jesus in, but evidently he wasn't very hospitable, more, more hostile, perhaps, than he was hospitable. And so when he saw this spectacle going on, he said within himself, huh, if this man really was a prophet, <laughs> he'd know what kind of woman this was. Well, he already knew what kind of woman she was. She was just a woman that needed the Lord. That's how Jesus sees everybody. Amen? Amen. Jesus doesn't necessarily see a drug addict or an adulterer, or this or that. That's not what he sees. Jesus sees somebody in need of redemption. Jesus needs, sees somebody in need of a friend. Jesus sees somebody in need of a relationship with his Father. That's how and what he sees. We see people based upon, as Jesus says, who we think they are. Whether we think they are befitting of our this or that, but that's never in Jesus' vocabulary or his thought. But Simon, lifting himself up, said, if he only, <laughs> if he knew who she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. And of course, Jesus, knowing his thoughts, and by the way, God knows your thoughts. God knows more about you than you and I would like to know he knows more about you and I. And so we have the story, Jesus seizing that opportunity to not teach Simon a lesson, but to bring him to that attitude of gratitude. To bring him to a place where he understands his place before God. See, folks, we cannot advance in our spiritual walk with God until we know where we are in God. We have to know who we are in God. And it's quite simple. We need God. Amen? Amen. It's quite simple. It's not complicated at all. Everyone, if you read Romans 11, God's concluded everyone as a sinner in need of God. God's concluded everyone in need of grace. But he shows this, or he tells this parable to Simon to draw the point that there was a certain creditor, a banker or somebody that had two debtors. One owed him 500 days denarii means days wage. Okay, Most people stumble with that word. It just means a day's wage. So one man owed him 500 days' wages. Another one owed him only 50 days' wages. So we have a hyperbole here. we got the big extremes that Jews love to talk about. We've got two big ends, 10% in case you did the math. But neither of them could pay. It made no difference because what we don't see in this story is that when you could not pay your debt, you might go to prison. 
you might be sold into slavery. In other words, your livelihood was in jeopardy. If the creditor wanted to pull the account, you were in trouble. Jesus gave several other parables similar to this. So that's the behind-the-scenes story, that both of these people were in dire straits. Anybody ever been in dire straits? I'm not talking about the singing group, Dire Straits. I'm talking about Dire Straits. You ever wondered where the money was coming from to pay a bill? You ever wondered where this or that? Hasn't God been good? Hasn't God been good? Hasn't God been good? I cannot tell you how many times God's been Johnny on the spot with me. And you too. As Paul would say in just a minute in my closing scripture, that God is there when he needs to be there. But he says, neither one of these two debtors could pay it, so he canceled both the debts. He showed no partiality. He canceled both the debts, and then he went in for the juggler vein. You know, Jesus knows how to do it. It's like that rich young man that came to Jesus and asked him, what what one good thing must I do to get in to inherit eternal life? Tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I lack. Well, when Jesus told him what he lacked, he didn't like it. Did he? Because if you remember, he told that young man, go sell all you got. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me, and then you have riches in heaven. He couldn't do it. When we stand before God and say, Lord, what do we, what do we lack? We might not like the answer. I don't want to ask God what I lack. He may have a list. But he wanted to draw home the attitude of gratitude to Simon. Because then he said, now tell me, Simon, which one of those two do you think will be more thankful, grateful? Which one of those two? I think the correct answer could have also been both of them if they had the right attitude. Amen? But because we think in large numbers, we would have went, oh my gosh, the one that owed 500. But keep in mind, neither could pay, and I won't labor that anymore. But again, we come back to the woman. We come back to the woman because God holds her as the example. God holds her up as an attitude of gratitude. Because we find out that Simon evidently wasn't grateful for much. And here's what Jesus told her in verse or told him in verse 44. Now he turns to the woman that is probably still at his feet. You got it? He turns to the woman and he says to Simon, Simon, you see this woman right here? When I came into your house, ooh, I don't know about you, I've been dressed down a time or two in my life. My wife does a good job, by the way. I'm not picking on her today, but you know, wives are historical. They remember, who said that? <laughs> they remember stuff we husbands have forgot. Well, you're, you husbands are going to leave me to hang today. That's okay. But Jesus says, do you see this woman? I entered into your house. You invited me. I didn't invite myself. You extended, or at least it looked like, now I'm paraphrasing this in my own words now, you thought you could extend hospitality to me and the city would look, look, Simon's inviting Jesus into your home. But you know what? When I came into your house, you did not wash my feet, which was common. Remember that. Next time you invite someone into your home, you're supposed to wash their feet when they come in. Remember that. But you didn't give me any water, but you bathed your feet. She bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, which is a kiss of friendship. When you invited someone into your home in Palestine to this day, they will kiss you when you come in the door. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. Boy, you talk about a list. Man, he just... Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Wow, he's working him over. Woo. 
Wow. You did not anoint my head with oil. Isn't that the psalmist? Isn't that the psalmist? You anointeth my head with oil. My cup runneth over. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. What a spectacle that day. You talk about an attitude of gratitude. And Paul, to sum it all up, says it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. Paul says to give thanks in all circumstances. Whew. Well, that makes me pause. How about you? All circumstances. This goes back to several weeks ago when I preached from the book of Romans, 8 chapter, that all things work together for good to them that are the called, right, and love him and walk according to his purpose. All things work together. And I don't know about you, but I've, behind, <laughs> I've been behind the eight ball and the cue ball a few times, right? Matter of fact, I've scratched. I've been knocked off the table. How about you? But Paul says, whatever circumstances you're in, we should give thanks because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In other words, Paul says, gratitude is always expressed somehow. And to tie it all up, he has some wonderful words to the Philippians in 4.10. He says that I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have now at last you have received your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me but had no opportunity to show it. We don't know what they did. They perhaps sent him an offering. But he had been in need. They, they had never been able to show how thankful they were. Have you ever had somebody come by and help you out of the blue, and you are just so thankful they showed up? Because that's what you needed. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, but you've had no opportunity to show it. But now he adds this. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned. In other words, I've watched how God operates. I watch how God has moved in my life. I've watched how God ministers, and I've learned something from it. I've learned something from it. And what I have learned is to be content with whatever I have. That's a hard one too, isn't it? To be content. Because he goes on to say, I know what it is like to have little. Been there, done that. How about you? I helped raise three kids. How many kids you helped raise? Notice I said help. Because it takes two. It takes parents. But many of us here, as we were raising our children, things were sparse, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Things were sparse. Yes, no? Things were sparse. You know what it's like not to have? Because you're wanting your children to have the things and this and that. I hope you're understanding that later on, hopefully someday in their life and your life, before you're gone on to meet Jesus, one of your children will say, Mom or Dad, thank you for what you did for us. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you. I now recognize what you did for us when we were growing up. You know, they don't realize it. They don't realize it. They think we are, meaning parents, children, I think today's the same story. They think we're cramping their style, right? They think they're doing without, I see your mother's grinning there, yeah, this and that. But we're not. We're trying to help them. And you know what? I can go to my grave right now <laughs> that my oldest daughter called me a year or two ago and out of the blue said, Dad, thank you for what you did raising me because I see now what I'm doing for my own daughter I'm glad I was sitting down when I heard that because I wasn't prepared amen I was have have any of you heard that from your children yet anyway there thank you yeah I think they will in time 
in time, but Paul says, I know what it's like to have little, I know what it's like to have plenty, and I've learned in all circumstance. Notice what he says. I have learned the secret. I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? The secret and the contentment is God. Being happy in the Lord. That's the secret of contentment. So our challenge, of course, is not just Thanksgiving. It's a shame Thanksgiving comes so fast and then it's gone and the retailers push Christmas up right to it. It's almost like it's here and it's gone. But it is a wonderful time at least to stop. And we all get together and we give thanks. But you've heard it before. Let's just not make Thanksgiving a one-day celebration. Let's make Thanksgiving an all-year thing, giving thanks to God and to others, to have that attitude of gratitude, and to give us a preview of next week starts Advent. How many of you know that? Next week starts Christmas season. So we have four Sundays. We're leading up to Christmas and the 12 days afterward and 12 somebody leaping and Levin does something and you know how that song goes but that we should have that Thanksgiving and that Christmas celebration all year long because isn't Jesus a gift that keeps on giving all year long isn't God a God that keeps on giving and we should be thankful for all year long So as Paul would say, gratitude should be expressed somehow. Let us pray. Precious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can have an attitude of gratitude that we know at times we have failed, perhaps even like Simon, to show the the right amount of hospitality and the right right amount of thankfulness. But, But Lord, help us to just see our place with you that we truly are blessed people of God. Whether we live in a shack or live in a mansion makes no difference. We can all be blessed of God. That, Lord, we know that perhaps sometimes those that have the least are thankful the most, which is what you also show us in this parable. But, Lord, help us to have that attitude of gratitude, not just this week, not just during Advent, but help us show it all year long. And let us also be those who give to others that they can show their gratitude as well. Because, Lord, we're all your people. We all need blessed. We all need help. We all need hope. And, Lord, above all, you've given us the greatest gift of all to be thankful for, which is Jesus Christ. Let us show that thanksgiving every day. Give us a blessing today, Lord. And give us a blessing this week as we gather together with our family and friends. On Thanksgiving, let us pause and think about those that may not be as blessed. And Lord, just help us to find those that will cross our paths, that we can be a blessing to them. In Christ's name, I ask it and pray. Amen.